Welcome to the Arts for Mental Health Conference, featuring presentations aimed at informing purposeful discussion on the benefits of arts for mental health. In a study based on the 2016 Statistics Canada General Social Survey, the Canadian Council for the Arts found that 52% of Canadians who participated in 15 arts, culture, and heritage activities were more likely to report very good or excellent mental health than non-attendees or non-participants. This study looked at activities such as live music, art galleries, reading books, art and culture festivals, and theater comedy shows. Today and going forward, you have the opportunity to harness some remarkable research and brain power to help inform practical recommendations for an uplifting arts for mental health program in Peel. It is my hope that by connecting health and social services agencies with creative groups, that we can foster creative experiences that are accessible to those who will benefit from them the most. I'd like to thank Mississauga Arts Council for trusting mass culture and working with us in a truly collaborative way to bring us all together here today to further explore an idea steeped in evidence and energized by Mississauga Arts Council and its network. That idea, an accessible program designed with medical and social service professionals in mind that prescribes and refers mental health clients to engage in creative experiences appropriate to their needs. Why not arts care? Ontario residents enjoy free health care, but it is actually very expensive, posing the question, are there better ways to get well than to engage doctors, clinics, drugs, and hospitals? Often yes is the obvious answer. From the first fire, humankind have been healing their spirits with images and song, stories, and art. In 2014, the British government's all-party parliamentary group on arts health and well-being was formed. Our aim is to improve awareness of the benefits that the arts can bring to health and well-being, and to stimulate progress towards making these benefits a reality all across the country. Inspired by that goal, we share highlight bindings from the Creative Inquiry. At the outset, they state that it is time to recognize the powerful contribution the arts can make to health and well-being. They provide many examples and much evidence of the beneficial impact creative experiences have. The report notes three key messages. The arts can help keep us well, aid our recovery, and support longer lives better lived. The arts can help meet major challenges facing health and social care, aging, long-term conditions, loneliness, and mental health. The arts can help save money in the health service and social care. They found that the arts are a principal social determinant of health and well-being, if you have access to them. Across all age groups and demographics, positive results were found. They firmly believe that the arts can be enlisted to assist in addressing a number of difficult and pressing policy challenges. The heart rate of newborn babies is calmed by the playing of lullabies. The use of music in neonatal intensive care leads to reduced stays. Visual and performing arts in healthcare environments help to reduce sickness, anxiety, and stress. Participatory arts programs for group arts activities intended to improve and maintain health and well-being in health and social care settings. The inquiry found that after engaging with the arts, 79% of people in deprived communities in London ate more healthily, 77% engaged in more physical activity, and 82% enjoyed greater well-being. Participatory arts activities with children improve their cognitive, linguistic, social, and emotional development, and enhance school readiness and attendance. Participatory arts activities help to alleviate anxiety, depression, and stress, both within and outside of work. For every one pound invested in arts participation, estimate 13 pounds saved in future care costs. Art therapies. Drama, music, and visual arts activities offered to individuals, usually in clinical settings by accredited health and care professions. Music therapy reduces agitation, a need for medication in 67% of people with dementia. Arts therapies help people to recover from brain injury more quickly. They diminish the physical and emotional suffering of cancer patients and reduce the side effects of their treatment. 
arts therapies have been found to alleviate anxiety, depression, and stress, while increasing resilience and well-being. Arts on Prescription An arts on prescription project has shown a 37% drop in general practitioner visits and a 27% reduction in hospital admissions, a saving of £216 per patient per year. Within the National Health Service, 10 million working days are lost due to sick leave every year, costing £2.4 billion. Arts engagement helps health and care staff to improve their own health and well-being, as well as that of their patients. Attendance at cultural events. Cultural engagement reduces work-related stress and leads to longer, happier lives. Attendance tends to be determined by educational level, prosperity, and ethnicity. These findings prompt one final question for us. Why not arts care? But there's one that I want to just end on today, and that's the principle of entrainment. Entrainment that can be found in such a variety of science areas from from chemistry, pharmacology to also astronomy and architecture. And the classic example has always shown these two heartbeats, these two hearts coming together and beginning to pulse together, becoming synchronous, two heartbeats being able to do that. The word entrainment describes merging with or synchronizing to. You can imagine the parents synchronizing to the music and filling that space. I, so I want to leave you with this thought today. Over this last many months that we've had moments of, and we talked about it a lot, of just feeling disconnected, that we weren't merging with, that we weren't think, feeling synchronous. Is it possible that maybe what we were deeply missing was this feeling of entraining with someone else, that person who really gets it, that really gets us, that we can feel our heartbeats beginning to come together. So I leave you with this thought today, that as you move forward, as you begin to add more music and life intentionally into your world, as we begin to emerge into this world that we are so excited to live, that we begin to look around all the moments that we can entrain with one another. And I may be a little biased, but I can't believe there's any better way than through the arts. And for me, music in particular. There is no more efficient or effective way for us to feel that deep level of connection. Thank you. Dr. Saldana is a family physician who has a long and distinguished history of public service and has been a staunch advocate for social justice and mental health. As a committed and tireless community leader, he has served as chair of the Peel Police Services Board, Mississauga Board of Trade, United Way, the Health Policy Committee of the Ontario Chamber of Commerce, and has also been a member of the Board of Trustees of the Royal Ontario Museum. As chair of the Public Policy Committee of United Way of Peel Region, he initiated a non-pharmacological approach to mental health. Most re recently, on September 15th, Colin hosted a virtual dinner sponsored by Mississauga Arts Council, engaging his colleagues in a discussion on questions, challenges and ideas on creating an arts and mental health program. Thank you, Colin, for keeping this conversation ongoing and for taking a moment to share some of your insights with us today. I will now turn it over to you, Dr. Saldana. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Colin Saldana and uh, I've been practicing family medicine for now over 30 years. And uh, like many of my colleagues, we all have come to the understanding that there is more to managing a patient than just prescribing medication. And uh, I myself felt very frustrated when I was dealing with uh, 
patients with depression, psychosis, that all I was doing essentially was prescribing medications and making the referral on to a psychiatrist. And I began to realize perhaps there's more to it. And I could sense there was that veil between me and my patient and my patient's response to my engagement with him at, at the office. And I was curious, and many times I would ask them what interested them. And there was just that blank look. There was a sense of despondency. There was a sense of worthlessness. And one day I remember asking one of my patients, what do you do in your spare time? And he said, sleep. I asked another person, what do you do in your spare time? And she said, well, I enjoy going out for a walk with my mother. And I began to, to, to try to understand more what goes on behind the scenes. And then there was this elderly patient and like Jennifer, I do palliative care medicine and I look after the elderly and I saw on the wall some paintings of his and we sat down, I had some extra time, and I said, tell me more about this painting. And he was a patient who was, had mild cognitive impairment with depression, and his face just lit up. And he began to tell me the story about how he would go to the cottage when he was a kid, and how he would go fishing, and he would describe those things to me. And there was a sense of great fulfillment in, 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 in what he was trying to say to me. And I began to realize that this gave him a certain measure of joy, accomplishment that really wasn't there for him. And so I came back to my practice and I began asking my patients what excited them. Building up on that discussion that we had, we're all sold on the benefit of it. We know the role that uh, therapy plays in the release of endorphins, of serotonin, dopamine, the interactions, the drugs that we give. But I began to realize that we are not tapping on all the senses, the auditory, the visual, the verbal, the tactile. And those are so important. When we talk of therapy, we often mean therapy means medication, but there is so much more to therapy that augments the role of medication. And we said, so what are the challenges? What are the barriers? And the barriers essentially are that you are a great group of artists that do a lot of work. There's a tremendous body of evidence that shows that art in various forms, music as mentioned by Jennifer, but in, 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 as, in, as in painting, promotes the well-being of the individual by releasing the hormones, the good hormones, the endorphins that give them a sense of, of meaning and fulfillment. And if we integrate that in the system, that will enhance their productivity, this respect, the self-esteem, and will also probably, in most cases, as studies have shown, will decrease the amount of medication that I need to give to these individuals. So my colleagues felt that creating an awareness among physicians, showing that there's a seamless process of how we can implement the program, the dementia classes that we exist, how can we augment them? The youth and those at risk. When I have somebody who comes to me and says they've got back pain, what do I do? I analyze the cause of the back pain. I look at, are there any red flags? And I use the word red flags, could they be cancer? Could they be other kind of such associated factors? And if it's just mechanical, I'll give them this checklist that I send them to the physiotherapist. On this is full rehab, post-op, that means after surgery rehab, chiropractor, physio, massage therapy, acupuncture, vestibular rehab, pelvic health, post-concussion rehab. So I have this little checklist. I'll take it off. I'll take it. They go over to the, uh, to the uh, physiotherapist and they will address it that way. Can you imagine if I had a checklist like this in my office, which talked about the various therapy program, um, art programs that exist in my community that are available to assist my patient depending on what their needs are. Do you like music? Do you like art? Do you like um, dance? Whatever the programs are, if I was to tick it off with, a one, with the equivalent of a 1-800 number or a main number, they go there, they call it, and they get engaged in it. So I think these interventions are really important. now. Where do we go from a practical point of view? Where do we go 
to now implementing it. I think one of the ways that we need to demonstrate in Peel region, and this could be done across the country, if you take child psychiatry and we go to them and say to them, we need to augment your programming with some artwork, with some music, engage in a discussion, see what, it, what children would like. We could go to the dementia clinic. We could go to at-risk youth clinic that we have. And we take 10 patients in each of these and do a pre or an entry level assessment, develop a program, let them try to exhibit their work, talk about their work, write about their work, televise their work, all of that. And let's see what does that do to them in terms of outcomes. Did I have to increase their medication? Have the side effects decreased? is the shorter duration of the treatment that I've given them. All of this, we package it. And if we can make the case, then we can roll it out into our community with individuals or family doctors like myself or psychiatrists. What I'm trying to create here is, how do we integrate medicine and the arts together? Because one is not exclusive of the other in the management of patients with depression. And you and I have this unique opportunity through art, providing your time and your talent and your expertise to the medical profession. And here we can integrate our services together for a common outcome, creating a healthier, more resilient society who are capable of producing more, delivering more, not only for the individual, but for their families. Right now, I don't know where to refer my patients, and I'm referring, I'm speaking as an average family physician in Mississauga. I don't know where to refer them to. I know it's an important thing to do. Mm -hmm. I know it's important. I don't know where to send them. So creating for now a virtual center where I would say to them, you know what, if you like art, why don't you go to the River Run art uh, program? Or you need to go there. Doc, what's the phone number? Oh, check it online. No, that's a barrier they've put in place there for them. And I think we need to eliminate because they are already drowning in, in despondency that I don't need for them to go hunting around because I know how frustrating it is for me who's not tech savvy to go hunting. So a repository of information in one place that they can go to. Thank you. And what an inspiring first act we've had. So we continue on to act two. It is my pleasure to introduce to you today our two panelists, Dr. Chance Young and Chris Long. Both of these individuals will be sharing with you the topic and discussions around the psychology of creativity that demonstrates and explores the impact that the arts have on our mental health. We are really at a turning point in time and history where the conversations and the actions around what we need to do to support our mental health are really important. I have been doing neuropsychiatry and community psychiatry for uh, quite a little while now. And one of the things that I've actually learned over the number of years is that, as Dr. Saldana said, medications by itself doesn't really help that much. It helps up to a point, but only up to a point. It needs other things to actually kind of finish off a person's life to actually make that person feel complete and recovered. Because if you don't provide that additional thing, you've actually just kind of made them physiologically better, but haven't really done anything much about making them psychologically better. So I think you, that's why you need all of the things that Dr. Saldana and even Jennifer was talking about in terms of bringing in the arts and bringing in other types of therapies to actually make the person whole again. Because one of the things that happens in people with mental health or even brain injury is not just loss of their mood in terms of them becoming sad or in terms of them getting anxious. It's also loss of who they are as people. It's a loss of their self-confidence, their image of themselves. It's a loss of their identity to some extent because our identity is often based on what is it that we do in, in our lives. I mean, well, the type of job that we have, the the activities that we were able to do, the committees that we were part of, part and parcel of, all of that is makes us who we are. And if you are unable to do all of those things, even if we are less depressed, but we are sitting at home doing nothing, 
we are not better. We are less depressed, that's all we are. But in addition to that, there are also changes in something called the uh, default mode network in the brain. Now, this actually is an area of the brain that is at rest, is important in the comprehension of emotional states. The comprehension of what the intentions of others are in empathy is, uh, it talks about both the positive and the negative connect aspects of someone. So that's the default mode network that's at rest in our brains. And that gets changed in psychiatric conditions such as depression and anxiety. And if that area of the brain, and this includes the, uh, the medial prefrontal cortex and certain other areas of the brain, right, the parietal cortex, if that area isn't functioning well, then all of the components that particular area of the brain controls is not functioning well. So that includes the empathy that we have. So a lot of patients who are depressed are not empathic because they can't focus more than themselves. And so that means there's a certain level of neuroplasticity that happens in brains. So the, there are actually no, new neurons that's forming and new connections being formed by the arts. And this is just artistic. And there wasn't any other kind of additional treatment. It's just the pure arts that they tried it. So it's two groups of people, one who got the arts and one who didn't, right? And they compared these two people. So their cognition got better. Their ability to function and interact with people got better. Their social functioning got better. And all of that is, again, who we are as a people. There's also a concept that's called psychological resilience. And psychological resilience is basically the, the amount of reserves we have, in a sense, to, to kind of manage stress. And they also found that in these patients that the psychological resilience actually went up. So if we can manage stress better, if we can manage environmental cues better, then basically we can then also manage the the, the slings and arrows that we always have to face. And that might be inclu include what th the things that Chris has to kind of go through, I mean, suddenly out of the blue, right? And because that becomes not just the kind of the day-to-day -day stressors at work and everything else, but also the sudden unexpected things that ha can happen to us. The program that I was in, Next Step to Active Living, I was lucky because I was referred to it when I was in the hospital. I'm not sure they're doing that anymore. And I think that we have spoken about that before. So I think, I think there needs to be, this needs to be citywide, this needs to be countrywide, and it needs to be a regular thing for anybody who's going through something like this to have this availability. And um, anybody who's been, uh, who's had this experience, and I think you're right in starting it off with children, and moving it into senior centers, um, anybody needs to have this availability um, because it helps and it breaks down stigma. It breaks, it, it creates community and it helps people to get better. Hello everyone. I'm Lena DeMarco, Regional Director of Community Affairs for Bell Canada. I'm delighted to join you today in support of the vital work you are doing to support mental health and wellness, which is the cornerstone of Bell's community programs. Since launching Bell Let's Talk in 2010, a time when mental health was not widely discussed, we have committed over $100 million to raise awareness and combat stigma surrounding mental health and supporting hundreds of organizations doing important work across the country. Although there is still much to be done, which is why I am delighted to recognize the work of Susan Kasiapolsky. Susan believes that writing can heal. She's an author and the founder of Write Well, which helps people find their path to wellness by unleashing the power of writing. She's an active facilitator with the Writers Collective of Canada, running writer workshops for vulnerable communities in the GTA. Her recent documentary, The Art of Wellness, produced for Bell and Mac, gave a voice to local arts program producers and their happy participants. Susan has been an active champion for creative experiences that are designed for those who need them the most. Congratulations, Susan. You are a most worthy winner at this year's Arts for Mental Health Award, sponsored by Bell and the Mississauga Arts Council. 
I think we have so much more work to do. I'm excited for the rest of the conference actually, because we're going to be going into the breakout rooms where we can actually discuss and sort out how we can do more of this and make it better because everyone needs access. Chris, you talked about this. Everyone needs access to these kinds of programs and they have to be affordable. We can't have people having to uh, scrimp together and, and figure out how to make it happen because it is powerful. It is, it is life-changing, it is transformative. So from the perspective of our clients, we found the arts were, have been extraordinarily um, effective um, in helping older adults and especially older adults with dementia um, engage in processes that enhance, you know, I think someone mentioned it earlier, the idea of enhancing self-esteem and confidence is so critical in a health journey. Um, engaging in, in these kinds of creative processes um, help people start to either see aspects of themselves that were previously unacknowledged or um, communicate aspects of their of themselves that have are unable to access because in 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 our um, in our work with our population the loss of verbal communication we are extremely reliant um, on the ability to communicate verbally and as cognition changes and language the language skills get lost um, the ability to express thoughts and, and ideas become lost with them so when we can tap into ideas and thoughts in different ways um, it, it's extremely critical to um, to to true engagement with a client and being able to provide care um, also for the tendency to push back against um, the reduction of a person um, as a, in, in their disease or, or uh, by their being defined by their disease. Um, this unfortunately happens and labels are rampant in, in, in healthcare uh, and labels uh, are laden with um, assumptions. And uh, the arts do a really good job at pushing back against those assumptions. So, you know, we've had um, our re artist in residence um, programs be integrated into so many different um, so many different areas of the hospital. We had an occupational therapist working, co-facilitating a social skills program with an artist and a storyteller in residence um, in an inpatient psychiatric unit. Uh, we've had dancers in residence moving through our long-term care home and, and doing pop-ups in our laundry rooms and in our food services departments and um, letting people wake up to other parts of themselves. I mean, that's the other component of this. I wanted to just share a couple of, of quotes from clients that you know I always love to collect. Um, I try, I learn, I accomplish, I enjoy it very much. You never finish learning as long as you live. The enjoyment of realizing to do something is terrific, to do something with my own eyes, my own hands, as long as I'm here, as long as I'm alive, I will do. It's a feeling that I exist in this world. Um, and, you know, these are just a couple of, of examples of, of um, testimonials. Remembering uh, about the value of, or what it means actually to, to provide care and the humanistic component of that is something that the arts are, are really important and can be leveraged to do. So, you know, the arts really are low hanging fruit for a, for a healthcare organization. We, when you think about all these, these multiple ways of, of using them um, and, and leveraging them, um, it's so cost effective and uh, so uh, so multifaceted. It's 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 kind of hard to believe that it's not more common. So, what does it take for the health system to support the physical, mental, social health of a person, their holistic well being? Now, what if instead of asking what's the matter with you in healthcare, we ask what matters to you? And you know, what if along with medication, we can prescribe art and dance classes, and volunteer roles and caregiving support and supportive peer networks? And I think that's what we've been talking about all throughout this afternoon. And it is really the heart of social prescribing. And in 2018, uh, the Alliance for Healthier Communities implemented a social prescribing project in 11 communities across Ontario, and we called it Prescription Community, so RX Community. And to give you a little bit of context, um, the Alliance for Healthier Communities is a network of 
over 100 community-governed comprehensive primary health care organizations across Ontario. So that includes community health centers um, and nurse practitioner at clinics, Aboriginal health access centers, and community-led family health teams. So the organizations are focused on serving people who have complex social and medical needs and face higher barriers to health. The organizations are team-based and they typically deliver a range of clinical, allied health, health promotion, and social and community support services. So if you think about a family's doctor, family doctor's office nestled within a community hub, that's kind of the idea. So our project was implemented in a mix of urban, rural, francophone, northern communities, which is very diverse. So social prescribing looked a little bit different because it had to adapt to the different resources and needs in each region. But we identified really five key core components that it had. Um, and so that has, which is really the, what you see on the slide here, which is a client, an individual that has healthcare needs and social needs, as well as interests and gifts and passions. A person that we call the prescriber. This is a healthcare provider, a doctor, a nurse practitioner, an allied health, um, health professional that sees the client for maybe a medical need, but also identifies that there is non-clinical issues here and there is non-clinical ways in which this person may be supported. So they provide them with a social prescription and connects them to a navigator. And this role is key. I think we heard earlier from um, Dr. Colin that you know, as a family physician, you don't know what the resources are out there in your community. That's not your training, that's not your role. So this navigator is the person who can have that conversation to say what, it, what does matter to you and then to be connected to the resources in the community um, and to connect this person to those different interventions that support their well being based on their goals and their interests, which are the social prescriptions. And that can be arts and culture, that can be um, nature, that can be um, community and social networks. Um, and then over, arching all of these is tracking, as being able to tell the story, follow the client's journey, assess the impact and the outcome. We were able to measure the impact of this work and we had very promising results in terms of the impacts. We saw a really significant 49% decrease in loneliness and people uh, reported increases in their mental health and increases in their engagement with other social activities. And that doesn't, that, that's not even measuring, um, um, like what's harder to measure, but what we've heard, I should say from the qualitative interviews is the increase in self-confidence, in the sense of giving back to their community, in the sense of purpose that, you know, some speakers have mentioned earlier that is so important to a person's well-being and how they see themselves and see that they have control. Um, and so, that has been just fantastic to see. And also there's a tremendous increase in people's sense of being more connected now to their community and being um, belonging and accepted in their community and in these groups that they attend and through um, the arts and through the art cultural participations that they were able to engage in. We also saw some really positive results with healthcare providers where over time, people saw the impact that it had on their clients' well-being, as well as a decrease in clients making inappropriate appointments and repeat visits. All right, so Workman Arts is a multidisciplinary arts organization that promotes a greater understanding of mental health and or addiction issues through creation and presentation. So we are an arts organization first. Um, we support artists with lived experience through a free art training program, public presentation opportunities, and partnerships with the broader art community. So I think where we, uh, you know, really you know, kind of mark ourselves as different is that we are not art therapy. Um, the staff primarily at Workman Arts, we are all artists, as you heard from my bio, I come from the arts community. Um, and, and actually have, prior to arriving to this job, very little, you know, mental health training. And when I arrived, essentially, you know, I was told just run it as you run any other arts organization. We are funded by the arts councils. We are funded for our public presentations. Um, so just keep doing what you're doing. 
Um, and really for 25 years, we were this scrappy arts organization that actually, you know, wasn't looking at what is the research behind this? How are we proving that we're doing what we say we're doing? Um, we just know that it's, it's working and people, you know, are feeling better, are feeling part of the community and are really invested in the art. So that comes to another point. It's really important to know that we are not art therapy. Um, I will say it a few times in this presentation that we are a full-fledged full arts organization. Um, and that and what we do is provide, you know, sort of a, a quality uh, basis for art practice and, and also for presentation. Um, so this is interesting because this kind of shows, you know, where we came from and where we're going and that, you know, you have these sort of, a, you know, uh, uh, quotes and more anecdotal evidence and then we started to move into let's see if we can actually say we're doing what we say we're doing and the goal was actually to start to replicate our programming around Ontario and so this is prior to my time at Workman Arts but reached out to the Ontario Trillium Foundation and said can we enter into you know this research phase into a replication phase um, and, and OTF, there are actually some program officers on, on this if they're still here, but, you know, wonderfully kind of supported three years of research um, into what our what are the programs doing for people with lived experience. What did we start to learn uh, about, you know, what was happening in the room, what was happening to the members. So. This one is really important to me, and I just want to take a, a moment to say this years with Workman Arts and feeling of belonging to a community. I think in, in walking through the doors at Workman Arts, you can really sense this community that people are there to engage in their art practice, to help each other, to give each other advice, to help each other with their projects. You know, directors can find actors that, you know, um, people can undertake, um, you know, things together. And, and that's, I think, really, really special. And it's such a positive thing that happens. And I think especially when you're looking at maybe you know, especially if people are coming from sort of, you know, recovering from addictions, that you're really looking for those positive things that people can do, um, you know, to help uh, maintain recovery and mental health. So you can see here that this goes numbers of years and then whether or not uh, they feel they belong to a community. And so you see from one to two years, two to five years, five to 10 years, more than 10 years, that that feeling of community is increasing. And hours spent at Workman Arts and feeling less anxious. Um, and you can see how the hours, the more hours spent, people report you know, less anxiety. Years with Workman Arts and having greater confidence. I also wanna pause for a moment on this one because this is one that also I feel quite a big shift. Um, I think one of the things that I see happen quite regularly is that removing and replacing of a label. When someone says, you know, I've been told I'm this and they put their mental health label on and you go, you know what, you're an artist, you're an actor, you're, um, you know, your voice matters. And not only does your voice matter, it matters so much that when you put your perspective on paper, when you write that play and tell me, you know, what, what, how you're experiencing the world, it holds value. People want to buy your art. They want to, you know, pay for tickets to see your show. They actually want to sit and watch your film. And that relabeling uh, is so, so, so valuable and giving someone confidence that their point of view matters. Because what is art but us expressing our points of view and our, and our view on the world? So projects like Art for Mental Health uh, invite us to carry on the conversation and help to further our understanding of how to effectively treat such a complex issue facing the mental well-being of Ontarians from many, many backgrounds. And I'm very proud that our government remains committed to the mental health of Ontarians across our province with our roadmap to wellness, uh, which commits $3.8 billion over 10 years to develop and implement a comprehensive and connected mental health and addiction system for Ontarians. I was also very proud to hear that uh, the Ontario Trillium Foundation uh, has been been supporting many important projects, including um, the Worksman Arts. And I really love um, the research component as well. I'm actually doing my master's right now in nursing. So I think uh, research is extremely, extremely important. So I'm very, very pleased that our government is supporting this through the Ontario Trillium Foundation. What I'd like to promise is that this isn't the end. 
um, this is the beginning. And so our artscare.ca website will remain active and we will be importing, as uh, Robin mentioned, new information to it as we've gathered it through the course of this process and continue to add valuable material as a reference point. And also, we're looking forward to meeting with Minister Tobolo. Uh, his reputation is outstanding. Uh, his genuine interest in the field is uh, inspiring. So we're very hopeful that of that $3.8 billion, uh, some money can be found to fund a pilot project with which we uh, put these practice ideas and needs to work so that we can come up with something that can be shared to any municipality across the country, and in particular to Ontario uh, communities, which you know share a government, share uh, an OHIP program that uh, can be expanded and has to. To see the number of people moving into healthcare uh, as they age, something significant has to happen uh, sooner than later. And uh, the numbers are striking. So we're at the right point in this. The government has really eloquently recognized a need for additional mental health care. And here we are with an opportunity to divert some of that demand into arts programs that already exist, but are underfunded or inconsistently funded, unsustainably funded. We have to make this organized, regular, predictable, and a part of the character of being a resident of Ontario. So we will uh, look forward to reporting to you on what comes of our meeting with Minister Tabolo. And I, I look forward to you know, launching a process that has us in a position where we have something very serious and tangible to talk about in 2022. Thankfully, I'm a very seasoned spoken word artist, so I can tell you that my heart is beating really fast right now. Like, wow, I'm gonna make a poem, okay. Out of all this brilliance, but I know uh, from years of practice that all I need to do is uh, <laughs> take a deep breath and go. And um, uh, my, the people who have trained me have taught me that my heart beating fast is a sign that I care. So I really care about all of this work being done well. Thank you again to everyone. Let's keep the conversation going with hope because we are more hopeful together. We can move mountains together through the healing power of the arts one drop at a time, wearing away those mountains of stigmas, stigma that exist in our minds. And we are here today. So well done. That's a beginning. But without a sense of purpose, we are nothing. I mean, who the heck are you when your breath is taken away, when you're awe inspired by the downward spiral that leaves its mark sometimes right on your face, like a mask you can't take off to show anyone how you really feel in the face of a loss of an identity, in the face of a loss that feels like everything when the only bomb is soup and the symphony what do you do? Where do you turn? Do you turn inward? Look at your brain. Know that it could make some changes because art is magic. Art heals, dance heals, stories heal if we have a little help, if we work together in community. There are so many of us here who are a testament to the power of the arts. Again, everything changes. In this pandemic, we need to do more to make it better, to create easy access because what we can do together is the sum of all of our stories learned, new opportunities to create new community. We know our audiences. We know we can prescribe specific disciplines and learn the language of our funders because we need to improve the quality of life for people. To help a saxophone open up the sun and shine on that childhood home that boxes us in for too long to know there is a way forward, to help people feel better and feel seen. We are invested in the arts that make each day just a little more livable. But when you start to put that together with inform, collaborate, inspire, inform, collaborate, inspire, look at it. We can measure loneliness before and after the project. 49% decrease a report from social prescribing. See, 
the arts do matter. We've got the data, we've got the stories, and that's how we'll inform and collaborate, inspire, and keep taking that multi-layered mixed methods uh, of research that's, that starts to change the cultural landscape and prioritize a resource for mental health now, a resource for the benefits of families, workers, artists, artists, artists. In some ways, our work doesn't end here. It just begins. Thank you very much. Thank you for trusting me with your words today, everyone. Congratulations. I look forward to seeing what comes next. Thank you.